Welcome back to the Azure podcast. Today is the 2nd of February in 2022. Happy Lunar New Year to all of those that celebrate. It is the year of the tiger. And today on Teams with us, we have Russell and our very special guest, Linda Nichols and Rita Costa, who will be sharing with us about Fusion Dev. Uh, before we go into our special guests, as usual, we have a couple different Azure updates to share. Uh, Russell, do you want to go first? Yeah, thank you. Um, the one that caught my eye was the public preview launch of Microsoft Azure Payment HSM service. Um, so HSM is a hardware security model module, and um, this whole service is about providing a PCI compliant way for um, end companies to basically transact real-time payments securely in Azure. Uh, it uses a, a Talis PayShield 10K payment um, hardware module, um, and, it, and that's all built in. And yeah, it sounds really, really interesting, and I, th I think it will, uh, yeah, quite a good one to explore maybe on a, on a later podcast. Um, Pay-as-you-go pricing model, hourly billing records the usage of those modules that are already spun up and pre-provisioned for us, um, and that tracks kind of like the performance and speed and so on. And that just gets added onto your normal monthly Azure bill. Um, and there's different SKUs you can ramp up and down depending on the demand of your business at the time. So I, yeah, I thought that one was really, really key, adding those extra features and benefits. So you know, reducing the amount of work that you have to do as an end user. Awesome, thank you. And I just realized I didn't say the episode number. This is episode 410. Wow. Um, and, and I do have two updates to show, share. Uh, one is around Azure Functions. So now uh, you're able to run PowerShell on Linux OS in Azure Functions, which I thought was, was really cool. Uh, the other one is the public preview of custom virtual network support for Azure Container Apps. This is one of probably the highest prioritize ask from a lot of customers we've heard from using container apps that they're very excited to try out this new service, but have some limitations around what they can do in terms of network options. So now uh, custom virtual network support is in public preview. Definitely give it a try. That's one of Any those updates? things that comes oh, to go those ahead. Uh, It's just one of those things that, that we add on, you know, as the previews go through, it's, it's, it's great that it's come so quickly to Azure Container Apps. Um, I've been playing around with that. It's a great service. Any updates that Linda or Rita you want to share? Oh, I was not prepared for this. <laughs> no, no worries, no worries. Functions with my answer. I came with one so goal. <laughs> if not, uh, we'll turn it over to you. Linda, can you tell us about yourself, what you do at Microsoft, and then Rita, will you do the same after Linda's then? Sure. So I am on the App Innovation Global Black Belt team for the Americas. Um, and so uh, we kind of cover everything related to apps. And that's really a pretty huge bucket of things. Um, and so that's why t today we're kind of talking about like the fusion of, a, of several things that we cover. Um, so um, I will pass it to Rita, who is my counterpart, basically uh, five hours uh, ahead of me. Yeah, so um, I'm based out of Portugal. I'm also part of the App Innovation Global Black Belt team. I've been in Microsoft for almost four years, always working on the app innovation space. And I think since last July, I started working on this fusion topic around Azure and Power Apps. Can I just ask, um, just for, for, for people that listen in, Global Black Belt, what's the quick kind of summary of what that role is? <laughs> it's a great title. Yeah, it's, a best name. Yeah. It, it's, it's like the best title at Microsoft, maybe anywhere. I mean, I would say that we're problem solvers. So I think we tend to dig really, really deep into a lot of our services, but also just application development in general and just application development problems and we look for solutions to those. So we're kind of like a, a second level support. Um, and then we all just go deep on different topics basically within the app innovation space. Yeah, and I think 
also one of the things that's very cool in our team is that we have this possibility of incubating new topics. So we are usually like the first ones having our hands dirty on something that is new. And we find like all of the bugs and all of the cool stuff too. And we share with our customers and also internally. So that's a very nice thing to do. Cool, thank you. So just to kick us off, what is Fusion Dev and what are we fusing together? Oh, starting big <laughs> with the $1 million question. Um, I don't know, do you want to start, Linda? Or do you yeah, start? yeah, I can, and then I'll, I'll, I'll pass it to you. So it's kind of two parts, really. There's the technology side of it, which is kind of using our power platform, which is like our low-code development platform with Azure, which is more of our professional developer platform, like in more enterprise. So there's that fusion there. That's part of the fusion dev. There's also this human side of it, which is kind of this idea of empowering people with low code. So with low code, obviously, there's a lower barrier to entry that you can empower people who actually don't really, I guess, classify as developers or identify as developers. Those people could be business users. Um, it could be IT people who just don't code. It could be pro devs like myself who just happen to be really bad UI designers and developers. So it's really like empowering people and not only empowering them to like create a lot more applications, but to create them faster. But then you also have the power of Azure connected to it. So really it just lowers the barrier of entry and just really, I, I think it's a, it's a good, I mean, you know, Fusion's a pretty good word for it, even though when you just say it, it sounds very confusing. This is, it's a real coincidence because today's the first time I've heard this phrase, Fusion Dev, come up um, when I was talking to one of our specialists today. Um, uh, yeah, I, I just found it really interesting. And I was wondering if this is one of those kind of changes that's a bit more cultural, a bit like DevOps, the way that the business has to think differently about how their dev team operates with the service delivery team. Here you've got kind of a new kind of developer that's a citizen type developer coming in. And are, are they, is it is it usually that way that you're adding those low code developers into an existing team and they're kind of augmenting it? Or do they lead on the development now and then get the get the traditional pro devs to do the back end, the real work, if you like, for, for people like me who are kind of traditional dev type people? Um, and and the the low code people do the front end and the nice you know solving the business problems really quickly. Well, you know, so one one really like a challenge that exists in traditional development is that developers get the requirements from a user, and then even even with the like even with agile, they still tend to go off and develop a thing, and then they have to go back to the user and kind of get more information. In this case, one kind of cool thing is we're sort of empowering. The SMEs to do some coding. So they so really in a business, it could be like a tinkerer or like your shadow IT team, I guess, that you know was creating access apps. Now they're creating real apps, but it could also be your business users who are just happen to know the subject matter better than anyone else. And now we're empowering them to be part of the process. Because maybe, yeah, they're developing the front end. Or you know they're they're working with the pro devs now to like really help shape the UI. So yeah, it, it is kind of an idea. The idea of I guess you know people who aren't developers at all, but it, it, it's a wide range there. I mean, really, your you know maker could be a data scientist. It could be a researcher. It could be a you know a PM. It could be somebody who just knows Excel really well. It's just somebody who isn't a traditional developer and they're taking their own individual skills and now they're part of the development process. It isn't just on the pro de developers. And, and not only does that make the software better, but also the pro devs don't have to do all the work. Now we can scale. And that's a problem obviously is not enough developers. Um, but I'll, I'll pass it to Rita to get your, get yeah, your opinion. <laughs> I think Russell touched on, on a very like um, important point and that we are always like talking in our internal V team is like the difference between fusion development and fusion teams and fusion development is very clear for us. Like it's this combination of different tools and different personas during the software development process. 
but a fusion team sometimes it's not that clear for us because um, it really depends from uh, organization to organization, like how companies organize their software developer teams. And sometimes it will be the local developers that will join the pro developers, or it will be like the local tooling that will join the pro code tooling or the other way around. So for me, like something that I'm always thinking is that, okay, fusion development, it's very clear for me now, but fusion teams, uh, it will be like, a hard uh, conversation with organizations and more similar to the de DevOps conversations that we have. Like we don't have a single solution for how a fusion team looks like, how many people, how many different profiles, like we are not there yet. And I'm not sure that like that we even need to be there now, um, but definitely a super interesting conversation like to have, like what is a fusion team? Um, and Linda was saying that um, like this this combination between these two profiles, like for me, uh, it's so interesting because we are democratizing the access to backend systems and data that were not available before to these business users and data scientists. So the amount of innovation that we can build today with local tooling on top of all of these backends, it's a, it's it's amazing. So we are democratizing the access uh, to these backends, and we are also democratizing like the innovation across the whole organization. Uh, so I think that's like the cool thing about fusion development. I'm really curious, was there a backstory of like how fusion dev came into place? Were there people that were, I I don't know from which side that like were in the low code, no code platform or in the pro code, they're like, we should work together. Or was well, this more of like someone somewhere had a great idea and then decided to spread it to other people? Like, I can't speak to how Microsoft decided this was a great place to, you know, put a lot of resources, but, but shadow IT has existed forever. And I think in a way we're just, we're saying, we're just acknowledging, okay, shadow IT is a thing and we're gonna now make, actually put these people to work. Um, and I say that because- Shadow IT. Exactly. Cause I mean, that is how I started. I worked on a, on a tech help desk and I wanted to like learn to code and make stuff. And so I made access apps and I made like a lot of them. And then they just, whenever the, you know, company wouldn't approve the developers to start a project, they would just say, Hey, Linda, can you make an access app that can do this exact same thing? And I would say, yeah. And then I made classic ASP web pages. I'm like showing my age here, but, um, so that's how I started. So for me, I think it's really cool, but kind of to Rita's point, there has to be trust there. And that's that's a big part of it. This isn't something that necessarily we as Microsoft can solve. That, you know, we can provide the technology, but the trust has to be there between the two teams. If the, the pro devs just feel like the, you know, the other makers or low code developers are, are rogues, then this whole thing doesn't work. So we just, we kind of become the technology marriage counselors here with Fusion Dev. <laughs> so that, yeah, that's kind of where I was going to go next was that how do you, when you've got people that aren't used to software development, they don't understand software development lifecycle, they probably don't understand the governance and, you know, the, the, the learning that we all had to go through to get source control working properly and how, how we have implementing source control for our organization. How do, how do we control that when there's these new people coming in that may be using tools that they just see as UI, they don't see files behind it that they need to check in or do get pushes and all the rest of it. How, how does that work with this? Yeah, I, I think we definitely need to uh, solve that gap like technology wise first. And we just need like we are talking about two different families of tooling, like we have the local platforms from one side and the, the public cloud from the other side, Azure on the other side. And it's normal that like those, that ALM part source controlling are not equal now, but I think like for the power platform side where, where we are making such an effort like to, to talk the same language as we are used to do on the pro code side, like, if we see the last updates on, I think it was last Ignite and build from 2020, like we see so many pro dev features coming for, for the power platform, like source, source controlling, uh, Git support, like Visual Studio extensions, like 
we are seeing so much effort to have the same language in the low code tooling and uh, the pro code tooling. And for me, like that's a good effort. And that's the first step, like solving the gap uh, technology wise. Of course, we will have the gap like more in terms of people because these are different, these are different profiles. And we are not usually like low coders or app makers are not usually thinking about ALM or source controlling. So that's a nurturing and education process that we will need to, to do with those kind of profiles, something that we take from granted for the pro dev side, but we cannot do that now on the low code side. So we really need to educate uh, low, low coders um, to the DevOps world. And it will be a challenge, but I think we are getting there. Um, on the on the power platform side, we have you know some tooling like the Center of Excellence toolkit for sort of locking down some things and providing some security there. But from I mean, Arita and I have talked a lot about this. From our perspective, though, coming from more of the Azure side, we we like sort of the API down approach. So we really like in these fusion architectures, we really like API management in there. Um, you know, just to provide even like a facade or that extra layer of security. Um, and so that helps too, I think, so that the pro devs can really, you know, I guess, secure the data and then provide access to the, you know, the makers on the power platform side, like in a more secure way. I mean, and that helps again, the trust there is that they don't feel like they're just handing like a loaded weapon to, you know, people who aren't, you know, traditional developers. Yeah, that makes sense. Sorry, Cynthia, I know you got your hand up. Oh, just, just one other thing about this, um, the technology part of this. So, could you mention there's a technology side and then there's a human side? And was the technology just about mixing those two together, or is there work that your teams or the engineering team are doing to to enhance and improve that experience in some way? Because um, I, I notice, you know, when you go to Logic Apps, you've got these great connectors, which to me are, are, are brilliant because they just save me any of that having to code APIs and do the rest of it. Um, so I'm using Logic Apps where before I would never have dreamt of doing that as a pro dev. Um, it, what else is going on that, that kind of helps with the Fusion dev story? Yeah, I think what Linda was saying about API management, uh, for us, it's really like the central piece integrating the pro dev world and the low code world. So um, like more technically speaking, we are looking at like pro developers uh, on their uh, backends and data rather than beyond Azure on prem. And we would have like all of that exposed through APIs and API management acting as a facade. And we have like this cool feature on API management. It's kind of a new one, I guess, or at least like it has a new, um, portal experience, and you can export directly from API management an API that you have exposed there as a power platform connector. So you can use that API, a connector is just a wrapper around an API. So you can use that API inside a power app, inside a power automate, so similar to logic apps. Uh, so you can use these APIs and build a whole application around it. So it's super cool. Uh, and so when we when we talk about technology in the Fusion Dev world, it's actually having all of our products integrated and having this end-to-end -end experience where you can start from the backend and ending up with a part platform without leaving uh, our stack. Of course, you can mix and match with other tooling, other APIs, but like we are building this integrated integrated experience around our stack with this cool export and import features, making it simpler to simple to to use like Azure pieces pieces on um, on Power Apps. So um, I don't know, Linda, what what do you have to say here? Yeah, I, I like I like the features in API management, but yeah, our engineering teams are definitely working pretty hard on this. I mean, they're looking at API management. They're also in looking at Power Platform and sort of looking at how they can ease that connection between Azure and Power Apps, but not do it in a way that's intrusive and not doing it in a way that it disturbs the um, experience that low code devs are used to within Power Platform. So it's like a very considerate change, I guess, on the engineering side <laughs> um, to make things easier. Um, but 
yeah, I think I think um, that making making data available to the other, you know, sort of like these business developers or makers. I mean, it's really like sparking some innovation there too, because when you're when you have access to the data and you can see what's available, then you get all these ideas about, well, what if we have an app to do this or or that, you know? Like my my first power app was using NASA APIs. And so because I wanted to make a power app and then I was like, okay, well, let's see what kind of space data is out there. And then I made one and then I was like, okay, I like this. This is cool. I didn't have to write any React and it looks pretty good. So I think I think that's kind of the draw there if we you know, starting with data. Linda, what you talked about towards the end actually leads me to the question that I have from people, because we, we talked just about a lot about what um, the business users or the low code developers have to learn about like application development in terms of ALM, in terms of source control. From a pro dev perspective, what are some of the hurdles or challenges that you all have to go through to kind of embrace this new idea of fusion development? I know you all mentioned trust now that you're exposing a lot of your endpoints to the business users, but what, what are things that convince you that this actually makes your life better as well? Yeah, I mean, I'm probably the wrong person to ask because I'm already like a low code advocate because I just, you know, because I come from a non-traditional development background and because I like to create things easily. I'm just, I'm not a natural front end dev. So for, for me, it's like, I'm like, oh, this makes total sense. But for a lot of pro devs, they they just don't really get the platform or, or any low code platform in general. They're just like, okay, we'll just create an app. It's not that hard, you know? So it is a matter of getting them to say, okay, well, you know, we need your help to create these DevOps pipelines, or we need your help maybe to create the custom connectors or to kind of set up the framework for the low code devs to have the access they need. And so again, it's a little bit of, a, of trust and it's a little bit of also convincing the pro devs, like all that huge backlog you have can start to go away if you, if you understand that you have to scale that you have to sort of pass the baton off to some of these business users to do these pieces that they're they're going to be really good at. Um, and you just, yeah, there aren't enough developers to develop all the apps. So you have to release some of that control. So yeah, like I said, it's a bit of a, like, a, like a psychological conversation here. But um, uh, yeah, I think there's definitely going to be a lot of skepticism. But I think once we see the results, then that will help change the minds too. I, yeah. I was kind of thinking through that. Sorry, Rita. I was kind of thinking through the process of, you know, if you're a single developer working on something, you've got a picture in your mind as to what the app looks like, how it's going to function. Therefore, you can tailor that API to be performant, make as least network calls or database calls as, as possible, and return the data that's fit for the screens that you're designing and building. W with this fusion model, that will involve the two people talking together quite a bit right is that is that one of the things that has to change in order to get that smoothly working i don't get how that would work i mean yes and no i mean of course you could also be brave and build a power app and building the back end and the power app uh, so both things i mean uh, i like to think that power apps also a tool for a pro developer just to be faster and like you can have like of course you can be more focused on your apis and make it performance and you can just try power apps and just see if it makes sense for that api uh if you don't have like anyone to talk to build your uh your ui and i, I think that is actually in going back to cynthia's point like one of the things that it's hardest in the pro developer world is like acknowledging that low code exists and that can help you uh in your software development process like i, I think like i i'm always uh saying and thinking about that movie i don't know if you watch like don't look up the movie i, I didn't watch it until the end so i'm not spoiling anything but it's just like you have this comet that is coming down to the earth and like everyone is like ignoring and 
but it's coming, right? And eventually it will hit us. I don't know because I didn't see the end, but I'm assuming, uh, I don't know, it's a comet and they give us like six months or whatever. And I was just telling Lena the other day, like, look, this comet is power apps and we are ignoring, like pro devs are ignoring power apps and they will be hit by power apps like one day or the other because we have this huge app gap challenge and we cannot build all the amount of applications that needs to be built. Like I think, I think IDC says that in the next five years, like 500 million of new applications will, will be built. And they were saying this in 2019, so before COVID, right? So I think the number, it's much higher now. And we are like, we don't have enough software developers. So uh, we really need to start thinking about software development in a non-traditional way. Uh, so this idea of embracing low code, even as a pro developer, just to build applications faster, I think, it's a huge challenge for the pro developer world, uh, even internally. Uh, but yeah, it's coming like it's this comet and we just need to embrace it and stop ignoring it. <laughs> Otherwise, I mean, uh, I don't know what happens in the end. I just need to watch the end of the movie to complete my analogy. <laughs> but, but yeah, I'm, I will see. <laughs> we will see. I was watch after the credits the too. <laughs> okay. I was thinking about the challenge from the other perspective. So from the low code developers coming in, trying to build a UI against an existing API that, so the developer might build a REST API or something that's very much conformant to, this is what the entity looks like, there's a get and an update or what have you, and getting frustrated because that's not gonna work for the for the UI that they've got in mind. Um, and then they've got to rely on the, the, the backend pro dev to do that work. I think the other way is probably a little bit easier as long as you can convince the pro dev that this is actually really programming as well. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's been kind of the the communication between front end and back end devs too for for a long time. I mean, you know, the back end dev shaping the API and the front end developer saying this doesn't work for me and needs to be in a different format. Um, so it's a matter of, I guess, considering these low code developers as you know, like real developers. You know, <laughs> that's a whole nother discussion. But um, yeah, like um, I like <laughs> another space analogy, I guess. Like, I, I think of, like, the movie Armageddon, you know? Like, you have the NASA astronauts, and then they have to bring in the miners to help mine the asteroid. And so the miners are your, like, citizen devs, your loco devs, and then you have your NASA astronauts that are like, who are these guys? I don't want them to, like, be in my spaceship. But they need their expertise to be able to complete this mission. And so I think about that movie a lot too as far as like the relationship between these two sides and like you know like the highly trained people who identify as astronauts and then they're like well you can't just train these miners to be astronauts but in reality it's a lot faster to take someone who has expertise mining right and and teach them how to like not basically die on a space mission than it does to to take someone who is a trained astronaut and teach them the intricacies of mining equipment you know i mean it's all a fake movie but you know <laughs> i think that <laughs> i can relate yeah you guys focus too much on catastrophes instead of worrying about <laughs> movies and catastrophes yeah uh, great yeah, yeah i'm sure that our engineering team just loves us comparing our products to you know end of life movies <laughs> That, so that last point, no, 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 that last point is, is, is really interesting in terms of like, it's coming and we, it's a matter of us deciding if we want to like approach it, we want to actually take a good look at it, or we like look away from it until it actually hits us or it, something explodes. Um, but but I'm I'm curious. Has have either of you seen working with customer that actually have accelerated a lot of the communication? Because right now, I I would assume that when you're a pro developer and you're developing an app for a business user, you would have to go through multiple conversations to actually understand what business problem they're trying to solve, and you may have to go like back and forth multiple times as well since they the business users may have a very clear idea of what they thought they said. And as like a receiver of that information, you would also have like, 
your own perception of what you thought you heard. I'm curious if Fusion Dev kind of like breaks that barrier in some sense and makes that business logic a lot faster to come around. Linda. I, yeah, I, I think so. I think so. I mean, I think because you're basically the, the people that hold the requirements are now more heavily involved. But, you know, we are finding though within companies, like I think when I first started exploring this, I thought everyone just sat in the same room with each other, you know, and it's kind of like, oh, okay, well, we'll talk to the power platform people and the engineers and we'll pull them all in one call. They don't always know each other. If you're talking about a giant company. You're, the people using Power Platform may have no idea who the engineers in the company are. And so, you know, they have to go maybe, you know, find some person in the back with the black hoodie or something and, and tap on their shoulder and ask for, you know, another deployment. <laughs> um, you know, so yeah, that's, that is interesting too, that it is really a lot of silos that exist. Um, and so, you know, it's, it makes me think about traditional development, like, how far away your requirements people are from the actual development team. So this is making, this is bringing them closer together, but there's just, there's silos that have to be torn down in order for this to work. And I think that's going to be a choice that I think leadership's going to have to make within these companies. Um, and, you know, they, their decisions are guided by efficiency, you know, money essentially at the end of the day. And I think that this will result in more apps being written and honestly more quality apps less back and forth on requirements and things like that. Um, and I, you know, so I think getting a lot of apps out faster will make leadership happier and, and maybe a little bit more inclined to like foster this relationship. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, companies and customers, like I'm seeing that it's easier if we are dealing with one app. So if we are, doing like what I call a reactive fusion development. So you have one specific need. So you have you know what is the API that you need to build and what is the power app that you need to build. So it's a reactive fusion conversation. But having a fusion culture, and for me that's the end game, but also the challenge, I think it will take more time. Like having this environment where everything that you have is exposed through this API catalog, like this place where you can feel inspired to build new applications. I mean, that will take time. And going to this point, that's an investment that companies will, will have to do. Um, even though like in a reactive way, in a specific app, we are getting there. But this fusion culture, I think that that's the biggest challenge, but also where the, the value is, to be honest. I don't know about you, Cynthia, but I've seen a, a massive uptake in terms of people writing power apps. Uh, and once they get the first one or two, it then snowballs because the company just sees the benefit in it and that and they start looking everywhere for where's the paper-based processes that we can get rid of now and we don't have to go and fund a massive IT project to go and do it anymore. So yeah, this is all this is all great, really timely. Yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of companies probably still have access databases and Excel sheets that are actually line of business apps just sitting out everywhere on various servers and OneDrive accounts. And so this is also a way to sort of put those under control, put them under a watchful eye and for the business to actually know what exists out there. Cause they may not have any idea how many line of business apps they have until they start to explore. And then someone says, oh wait, you know, Jane is retiring and she's the one that has managed this, this Excel database, quote, air quotes, you know, for 20 years, you know, those, those are the types of things that are, that, you know, can go to power apps. Yeah, I can see you laughing, Cynthia, but I, I see this all the time. It's just so prevalent. It's it's every company you go to. Uh, Linda and Rita, before we close, any any call to action you want to give out to our listeners or any resources that they should check out? Oh, definitely uh, start building your first power app. Like we have a very good documentation and definitely like everyone has 
uh, a use case, even if it's not in their business environment, in their personal life. Um, so just go and check our documentation and build your first part app. And as Russell was saying, like you will get addicted to it and you will start building like power apps everywhere for everything. <laughs> I hope. Yeah. <laughs> I would, um, we can, you know, we can provide some links too, but there's a, um, a fusion ebook that Rita and I love. We recommend to everyone. Um, there's also our, our learning path for fusion dev. Um, I would also say go and watch YouTube. April Denham is one of our um, developer advocates. She's amazing. I love all of her content. I, every time a new video comes out, I immediately watch it. But she, you know, she just made a Wordle game in Power Apps. Like, how cool is that? So, you know, I'd watch all her videos too to sort of understand the building and UI and all that as well. Awesome. Well, thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having us and to talk about Armageddon and space <laughs> and also fusion death. <laughs> yeah, it was a lot of fun. We didn't know that was the direction we we're going, but. <laughs> <laughs>